Many thanks to Gail and to Laura for those opening remarks and I think it's wonderful and, and very reassuring to everybody in the room uh, to have the ongoing support of the European Commission who clearly do so much work in this space. Um, as Gail said, we, we all have different hats on. Some of us are parents, grandparents, great-grandparents even, uh, but we all work with children and young people in, in different guises and it's important to support them. So for our opening session, we're going to have a keynote speech, which is going to be followed by a panel discussion, which will be chaired by June Lowry from the European Commission. Um, and it's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Thordis Elva. Uh, Thordis is a published author in 14 countries um, and her books and films and campaigns to prevent both on and offline violence meant that she was actually awarded the title of Woman of the Year uh, in her native Iceland in 2015. She's campaigning tirelessly to make the internet a safer place for women and girls in particular and she's absolutely passionate about this subject and speaks really powerfully on it and so without any further delay could you please give a very warm welcome to Thordis Elva. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today to discuss this pressing topic of how we make the internet a safer place, not least for women and girls, but ultimately for everyone. That's been a passion of mine for some years now. After 20 years of public speaking and writing about violence prevention, I realized six years ago that nobody was talking to the youth in my country about digital communication, particularly the intimate kind. So I went ahead, put together material, and educated 15,000 eager children and teenagers, as well as 3,000 relatively uncomfortable adults about these matters, in hundreds of lectures. I'm happy to share some of the things I learned along the way with you here today. For most of today's kids, the internet's obviously like the air they breathe. They can't fathom a world without it, and were uploaded onto the information superhighway before they were even born. In fact, future CEOs and leaders first siding on the internet will be something like this, followed by something like this. And we'll all be able to say, you've come such a long way, Madam President. I managed to hit my teens before the internet was available in every home, but I'm not much better off because this is the oldest picture that exists of me online. And that would be my impersonation of an old lady. I'm I'm hoping I'll age with more grace. Um, but the internet's not an alternate reality. It's very much the extension of the offline world. A continuum, if you will. Does anyone here have online banking? Can I see a show of hands? Oh, wow. Well, then you know that the money in your online bank is every bit as real as the money in your pocket. Has anyone taken an online course? Yes? Well, then you know that the knowledge that you got from that course is every bit as real as the knowledge you would have gotten in a classroom. Has anyone ever Googled any health-related symptoms? Well, then you know from those searches, they usually end up with you having to accept the fact that you're going to die <laughs> and it's going to be slow and painful. <laughs> However, having a Skype conversation with a doctor can be every bit as informative as sitting in the room with one. The internet has revolutionized human communication and brought forth endless opportunities for people of all genders in more or less all areas of life. It's created millions of jobs and empowered people across the globe. I think we can safely say that it's one of the most important inventions in human history ever. And it also gives us videos of cats wearing shark costumes while riding a Roomba while chasing a duckling. What is there not to like? That said, we live in a world that is unfortunately not gender equal. No country on the face of the planet has achieved full gender equality, neither economically, politically, or socially. We still have a gender pay gap in double digits. Women hold 24% of the world's parliamentary seats and represent only a quarter of people featured on the news. Globally, unpaid labor is still largely in the hands of women who in some places risk being married off at a young age, lose out on education, and be subject to a range of human rights abuses. Now online, gender inequality is manifested in the fact that women are 27 times more likely to be abused according to the UN Broadband Commission. And at least 9 million women in the EU have experienced a form of serious cyber violence. It's even worse for women and girls with intersectional identities 
who are, for example, disabled, black, or belong to the LGBTQIA community, who are abused even more frequently. None of this should come as a surprise because the internet exists on the same continuum as the offline world. What is a continuum anyway? I Googled it and I got the answer, a continuous series of elements or items that vary by such tiny differences that they do not seem to differ from one another. Sort of like a color continuum, right? So that's what I Googled next and I got this picture. Now, if we look at this, we see clear differences in each chapter from purple to green to yellow to red. But if we were to zoom in on this spectrum and take two points that were close to one another, we wouldn't see the difference in the nuances. Now, I'm going to rotate this scale and recreate the pyramid of gender-based violence, which shows escalating abuse towards women and girls. You may look at this and think, come on, sexist jokes are not the same as murder. And you're very right, they're not. And there are people down here at the bottom of the pyramid that are never going to move up. But those at the top are resting on all of this. Their actions are built on a wealth of cultural traditions, stereotypes, misconceptions, and prejudice that hold women and girls back and legitimize violence against them. Now, we all know what violence against women looks like in the offline world. We can all envision black eyes and shattered lives. But what does it look like online? I've divided it into two categories, uh, verbal, which is mostly text-based violence, and graphic violence, which is mostly image-based. Now, some of these forms can be manifested both ways. Uh, if we start with the verbal violence, we have sexist hate speech, and that includes um, slut shaming and victim blaming that's rooted in gender stereotypes. We have cyber bullying, which is repeated aggressive behavior. And then we have cyber harassment, which is basically the same as cyber bullying, except it has a sexual undertone. We have uh, cyber stalking, which is monitoring someone using electronic means, doxing, which is publishing personal information without consent, and mob attacks, where multiple people attack one individual. Now, in the graphic violence um, category, we have the image-based sexual abuse, which some of you may know as revenge porn. We also have upskirting. And with us here today, we have two champions in these very fields. We have Emma Holton and Gina Martin, and I can't wait to hear from them. We also have um, in this category, dick pics or unsolicited nude photos. We have sextortion, which is using intimate material as a means of blackmail, hacking, impersonation, trafficking, and child sexual abuse, which is known as grooming. Now, both men and women can perpetrate online abuse, and both men and women are subject to online abuse, but the consequences are very different. While only 16% of men find the last time they were abused online upsetting or extremely upsetting, as many as 75% of women experience serious consequences like sleep disturbances, and over half of them have difficulties concentrating for a long period of time. Why is the online abuse of women and girls so much more effective? The answer may lie in the fact that the harassment that's directed at women is much more likely to target their gender and be of a sexual nature, while the abuse men get is more surface level, like name calling. Online abuse of women is also more likely to be perpetrated by a man. According to the Swedish Crime Prevention Committee, men are behind 70% of online violence. Now, this brings me to another statistic that's all too well known among women and girls, and it's the one in three. One in three women will be sexually or physically abused by a male in her lifetime. Now, I, like millions of girls around the planet, was taught to take many precautions to avoid being sexually assaulted, to name one form of gender-based violence. I was taught never to walk alone after dark, never go out for an evening run, avoid certain outfits, not be too trusting, cover my drink in a bar, avoid eye contact with strangers, punch 911 on my phone when walking in a shady area. Does this sound familiar to anyone in this room? Has anyone taken similar precautions to avoid being sexually assaulted? Huh. I did not see a single man raise their hand. It seems fair to then draw the conclusion that at least here in this group of people, 
the men generally don't live in fear of being sexually assaulted, while many women do, because it's an experience that all too many of us have had, or know the women in our lives to have had. Not a day goes by where we're not reminded of this reality in media coverage. And ironically, I have aided to that awareness myself by sharing my own story of how none of the precautions I took saved me from being sexually assaulted. So this awareness of how likely we are to be subject to violence as women is there. It's in our fabric of life. And that's why threatening to harm us this way is so effective because it speaks straight to that fear. This sexually charged gendered abuse that successfully silences many women and girls is directed at them, for example, in spaces where pressing issues are being discussed on social media, as well as in the comment sections of news sites. This threatens to limit their participation in the public discourse, thereby undermining the very concept of democracy where all citizens have the right to speak their mind. Research by Amnesty International shows that 76% of women who experienced abuse or harassment on a social media platform made changes to the way they used the platforms, including restricting what they post about. A third of women said that they'd stopped posting content that expressed their opinion on certain issues. That is self-censorship on a massive level. What's the cost? Why does it matter if women and girls fall silent and stop engaging with pressing issues because of the abuse they receive? I could fish out numbers. I could tell you how it costs 140% more to assist someone who's fallen victim to an online abuser than someone who uses other methods to harm. I could speak about lost wages and millions of euros, chronic physical conditions, loss of life expectancy, and public expenditure on medical, judicial, judicial and social services. Again, in millions of euros, but I won't. Because millions of euros are, after all, only millions of euros. I'm going to argue that what we're losing out on if we don't create an online climate where women and girls are safe to partake is something much more valuable. The future of our planet. I'm assuming none of you live in a cave, so I take it we're all familiar with climate activist Greta Thunberg. What most people don't know is that women will be negatively affected by climate change substantially more so than men. According to the United Nations Development Program, 80% of people displaced by climate change are women. More than 70% of people who died in the 2004 Asian tsunami were women, as they were disproportionately trapped inside their homes while most men were out in the open. Women are also more vulnerable to climate change because they're often poorer, and in some cases, the clothes they wear or the responsibilities in caring for children could hamper their mobility in times of emergency. So it may not then be surprising that women have long been in the forefront of the climate change fight. A professor at the University of Maryland analyzed the crowd of 400,000 people that protested in the 2014 People's Climate March and found most of them to be educated, female, and politically liberal, which is consistent with other studies of volunteerism, charity work, and the environmental movement. The UNDP goes as far as to state that the increased participation of women is crucial to the climate effort. Simultaneously, women and girls are literally being silenced on the world's largest democratic venue at a time in human history when their voices have never been more important. Greta Thunberg is an example of a girl who receives such massive hatred and online abuse, mostly from middle-aged men, that it spills over to her 13-year-old little sister who has received death threats. Death threats. People who perpetrate hate speech or other abuse towards women online have long been, been dismissed as trolls. I'm afraid that we're not doing a good enough job of holding people accountable who spend their time abusing others online. In fact, calling them trolls is doing the opposite. It's pretending that they're not real, that they're mythological creatures. Women have long been avoided, urged to avoid feeding the troll, which can be damn near impossible, given that some abusers will attack anyone with a female name, according to research. So merely existing online while female can constitute feeding such a troll. This advice, however well meant it may have been originally, 
normalizes violence and silences victims who are instructed not to take any action when they're being attacked, which in turn creates a culture of impunity for perpetrators while minimizing the harm that they cause. It actually reminds me of a girl who told me that she'd been picked on at school by a boy since first grade when he used to shove her around and steal her hat and behave in all these intimidating ways. When she complained to the adults, she was told that he just had a crush on her. She shouldn't mind it. It would be best if she just tried to ignore it. After all, boys will be boys. Well, in the Me Too revolution, a magnificent example of how women and girls can use the internet to change the world, that rhetoric has been rejected. It's not acceptable to abuse and intimidate others and for that behavior to be normalized as a natural, inevitable part of boyhood and therefore of life. Moreover, how are girls supposed to learn how to draw boundaries if they're told from an early age that violating them is okay? That it might even be a sign that someone likes you. Now, if I had been nursing my babies this spring, which I often did, and a stranger would have walked up to me and begun to harass me with statements like, your parents should have drowned you at birth. And these are all examples of um, abuse I got online when posting pictures of me nursing. I doubt that anyone in this room would find it reasonable for me to pretend that it wasn't happening or for bystanders to ignore it. On the contrary, our aim should be to build communities where we support and defend one another from abuse, intervening when someone needs help. I find it worrying that we're sending the opposite message out to young people on a massive scale, that when abuse happens online, we should not speak up, not protect or challenge, because trolls will be trolls. Sure, there may be abusers who should best be ignored, but it's simply unreasonable to assume that everyone who's abusive online shares identical motivations and that there's only one way to respond to them all. Also, ignoring someone who's abusive, which I admittedly do myself at times, should be one of many choices, not an ultimatum. Children deserve a range of tools to help them navigate the world, not to be told that inflicting hurt on them is behavior that they should expect and ignore. Many of them simply can't, which can in turn make them feel like failures and add to their hopelessness and isolation, as evidenced by all too many cases of suicide by victims of online abuse. But we're here because we want to make the, make the internet a better place for young people. And in order to do that, we need to understand how they use it. Because when puberty hits, many of them go online to take their first steps into romance and sex. And as stated earlier, I've talked to 18,000 people about that matter, which leads me to the next topic, sexting. Now that most people have a smartphone, sexting, which is the sharing of intimate messages, often naked photos, has become commonplace with increasingly younger users. In Iceland, a study from last year shows that almost a third of 15-year-old girls have sent a nude photo or a provocative picture to someone using the internet as well as a fifth of boys. Nearly half of the girls have been asked for such a photo and nearly a third of the boys. For those of you who don't understand what motivates sexting, here's what young people say themselves about it. They say it's a way to express sexual desire in a consensual relationship. They say it's a way to discovering one's sexuality and having sexual relationships without the risks of sexual acts in person. You've got to give it to them. They've hacked sexually transmitted diseases. It's brilliant. <laughs> but sexting is also an activity that can affect you very differently depending on your gender. The aforementioned Icelandic research showed that girls experience as much as six times more pressure to send nude photos, sometimes feeling that they have no other choice. Girls as young as 13. This is worrying, not only because it's a clear violation of their rights and suggests grooming, but also because some studies point to as many as 25% of sexting images being forwarded to someone else without the sender's consent, which is yet another violation. That dramatically increases the likelihood of the image ending up online, where there's an 88% chance of it taking off and spreading to other sites, according to the Internet Watch Foundation. 
Which brings me to the issue of image-based sexual abuse, the act of sharing intimate photos or videos without the photographed individual's consent. Some of you may know this as revenge porn, which is a misnomer because it's neither revenge nor porn. In fact, the word revenge implies that the victim did something to anger the perpetrator, which in turn blames the victim. The word porn is misplaced too, because stripping someone in public without their consent is abuse, not porn. There's a widespread misconception that image-based sexual abuse is the doing of a disgruntled ex, usually. But the reality is that it can be a result of many things, such as theft, when someone's phone or computer is stolen that contains such images, hacking into storage clouds or email accounts or webcams, or the filming or live streaming of a sexual assault, also the secret filming of a partner during sex, or fake images that are a result of digital man manipulation. And grooming, of course, when kids are tricked into taking and sending nude photos. The reason why I'm standing here talking specifically with you about image-based sexual abuse is because it's unique in the sense that all other existing forms of cyber violence intersect here, all of them. Sexist hate speech, sextortion, doxing, child sexual abuse, you name it. According to a US study, 90% of victims are female, which makes it a form of gender-based violence. We have this problem in Iceland with one particularly infamous site that has been reported to the police countless of times over a number of years, and it's still there. A study showed that 99% of images on the site involved photos of females, 76% of whom were underage when the picture was taken. I'm going to warn you uh, that the language on the next slide uh, is, is quite hateful. It's a screenshot from this site. This shows typical interaction um, where a user, and they're all dubbed anonymous stalker, is advertising for nudes using a screenshot from a girl's social media account where her full name is visible, which is doxing. And she's often also tagged in these conversations, which further drags her name into, into this. It's then followed by vicious hate speech, threats, cyberbullying, harassment, and not to mention child sexual offenses, as most of these girls are underage. It often results in explicit photos being uploaded onto this site, either of the girl in question or others that are traded like baseball cards. I tracked one of the victims of this site, who was 16 when nude photos of her were uploaded there without her consent. These are the search results that I got from Googling her full name one year later. 16,200 results, and nearly all of them are porn. This is an underage girl, a child from a legal perspective, whose digital reputation has been hijacked. But it's not just digital. After one of my lectures, two 14-year-old girls pulled me aside and told me that the abusers on that very site had advertised for nude photos of them. They told me that no such photos existed, but just to be on the safe side, they'd quit going to gym classes in school and stop taking swimming lessons because they didn't feel safe undressing in spaces where someone could have a camera phone. These girls were shrinking their world and the space they occupy in it to avoid what I like to refer to as the next generation of sexual violence. Despite various removal methods, which are both time consuming and costly, chances are that some image based sexual abuse content may never be fully removed from the internet and that it may reappear at any given time, which re victimizes the survivor. And this is what makes various online abuses so insidious. They can be repeated in perpetuity. Whereas in the offline world, if someone sexually assaults you, that same assault cannot be replicated at any given point in the future. Not only does that notion leave victims with a sinking feeling of hopelessness, it's furthered by the fact that they're often made responsible for what happened to them. Six months ago, Hollywood actress Whoopi Goldberg used the opportunity to shame an image-based sexual abuse victim on television by saying, you just don't take nude photos. You don't get to do that. This sentiment has echoed in the public discourse for years and even found its way into edu educational material for youth. Apart from the blatant victim blaming, advising someone to simply not take nude photos in order to guarantee that they'll never fall victim to image-based sexual abuse is simply wrong, as it's all too easy to create fake nudes using Photoshop. So this advice provides a false sense of security while failing to address 
the perpetrator who does the non-consensual sharing and therefore causes the harm. The stigma and shame felt by victims of image-based sexual abuse have resulted in several high-profile suicides across the world. Hope was 13, uh, Audrey and Amanda were 15, Jessica and Reite were 17, Audrey and Reite were sexually assaulted while unconscious and pictures of the abuse were put online. Amanda was groomed by a man in his 30s who tricked her into sending him nudes. Uh, to the far left, we have Veronica, who's the newest um, victim. She is the only adult in this group of people. Uh, pictures of her were put online this spring. She committed suicide in May and left two young children behind. But the teenagers in this slide, none of them willingly confided in an adult with the torment they experienced when photos of them went online. And that tells us something about the number of ways in which we failed them. These deaths could have been avoided. These girls did not have to feel so alone, so ashamed that death was the only way out. If the sexual education curriculum in these girls' schools would have included a digital aspect, that teaches children how consent has to be the base of all intimate exchanges online as well as offline, and that those who violate others are to blame, not those who fall victim to such violations, I believe these girls would still be alive. And there are countless girls just like them out there whom it's not too late to save. In many of these cases, the perpetrators were these girls' peers, boys they grew up with. Which begs the question, what, what makes some boys dehumanize and objectify the girls in their lives to such a shocking degree? It's time to talk about the elephant in the room. Porn. Listen, I'm sure that in this very group of people, there's a range of opinions on porn, from those who think it's harmless to those who see it as a dehumanizing form of violence. Wherever you stand in that debate, I think we can all agree that porn and children should never mix. There's a reason why it's a punishable offense to show porn to a child. And yet we've done a remarkably shitty job at protecting children from seeing porn online. So studies suggest that most children see porn for the first time between the ages of 10 and 13. With the amount of porn that's being advertised in spaces that are specifically designed for children, such as coloring pages and gaming sites, the offline equivalent would be something like staging a live sex show in a playground. According to research, as much as 88% of porn contains acts of physical abuse that in 94% of the cases are directed towards a woman who usually responds neutrally or is made to seem like she enjoys it. In other words, the first time children see porn, there's an overwhelming risk they'll see a woman subjected to abuse at the hands of a man, suggesting that violence and sex go hand in hand. Research shows that this affects viewers with 22 studies from seven different countries showing that porn consumption is associated with sexual aggression in adults. Now, children are particularly vulnerable when it comes to misinformation they may encounter in porn, given that they have no sexual experience of their own to compare. And the sexual education in schools rarely or never addresses porn. I've had 15-year-old girls ask me how to best hide their tears from their boyfriends during sex because the slapping and hair pulling and roughness hurt so much and they were ashamed to be such wusses when all the porn they'd ever seen told them that they were supposed to like it this way. Similarly, I've had worried teenage boys confide in me with their performance anxiety because they're not comfortable with the dominance and aggression they're expected to carry out judging by the porn they've seen, including a boy who told me he was afraid he didn't know first aid well enough to have sex. And I asked him why on earth he would need to know first aid and he answered, in case she stops breathing. All the oral sex this boy had ever seen in porn involved gagging, where women passing out is not an uncommon occurrence. Now, children's access to violent porn would be of less concern if we were at least able to say that we're doing a decent job of countering it with extensive, up-to-date sexual education that addresses more than just the consequences of sex and goes as far as discussing emotional boundaries and intimacy. But I'm afraid that we're often letting kids down in that area too, which means that there's a risk that they fill in the gaps with porn, which means that 
we're ha going to have to do better at sex education and address porn for what it is, explaining to kids that it's a product. It's a fantasy that comes as close to portraying real life sex as Donald Duck comes to portraying real ducks. And for unfortunately, we have such educational material. It does exist, but we need to ensure that it reaches those who need it. The UK put forth an age verification law this summer that enforces porn distributors to verify the age of its users with electronic ID. Now, I think this sends the right message, so thanks for trying, Britain. But when I asked the teenagers around me what they thought of this, they shrugged and replied, whatever, we get our porn from Snapchat and Twitter anyway. Which brings up the fact that social media platforms are keen on welcoming users as young as 13, but seemingly not as keen on effectively keeping them from seeing porn. So how do we get from online violence to digital respect? I believe that there are many, many ways to get there. In terms of education, we can demand that digital communication is added to school curriculums and that children are taught what it means to be a responsible netizen. We can set aside vague blanket terms like trolling and replace it with a concept of hate speech that targets people based on their gender, race, disability, sexual orientation, nationality, gender identity, or religion. This would have the added benefit of deepening children's understanding of their own human rights, as well as the rights of others. What democracy means and why defending it is so crucial. We can demand that traditional sexual education is expanded to include debunking the harmful messages in porn and to address digital sexual communication. When I realized that I was the only person in Iceland who was talking to teenagers about sexting and image-based sexual abuse, I realized that this was not sustainable. So I contacted the organization for school nurses who are usually in charge of sex education. And I gave them a free workshop, equipping them with tools and know-how so they could carry on with this work. Most of them had never even heard of sexting, let alone how to support a victim of image-based sexual abuse. We need to be building similar armies elsewhere while educating parents and the public through awareness campaigns because it truly does take a village to raise a child, a global village, if you will. Now, to the policymakers and sponsors in this room, I want to say that it's also vital to keep investing in organizations and NGOs that work to prevent online abuse, as well as offer support services to victims, including psychological help. And there are many of you here in this room and you're doing invaluable work. From working with victims, I know that hotline services can be of utmost importance, especially if they're staffed with people that have the technical know-how to react immediately and help prevent the spreading of abusive material. Moreover, removal help for victims of image-based sexual abuse needs to be available in the local language. Uh, the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, as you can see here on this slide, they have removal guides on their website, which can be translated as a first step. Now, in terms of legislation, a gender perspective obviously needs to be applied when writing and adapting laws that criminalize online violence because, as we know, it impacts men and women in very different ways. Also, little things, simple things, like synchronizing our vocabulary to make it easier to share advice and experiences from one country to another. For example, dropping the word revenge porn and replacing it with image-based sexual abuse. The victims of such crimes need to be offered anonymity like the victims of any other sex crime to protect their privacy or else we risk them not coming forward at all out of fear that it will attract more attention to their pictures and in cases like these the attention is the violation we need to hold big platforms accountable for the hate speech abuse and porn that's available there and demand that they do better it's not acceptable that someone can write rape disabled women and for that to comply with community guidelines. That's an example that a, that a journalist at The Atlantic found on Instagram. In the same article, an anonymous Instagram employee is quoted saying, for almost a year, there was a link to a help page on the reporting flow that led to a broken page. How much do you have to drop the ball on your harassment reporting flow that you have a broken page for almost a year? she asked. 
Meanwhile, studies show that there's even more hate speech and harassment on platforms like Facebook and Twitter, where the CEO himself has said that Twitter has created a quote unquote, pretty terrible situation for women and particularly women of color. A new study from the NYU found a link between the number of racist tweets and real life hate crimes in a hundred US cities, which speaks volumes about the real life effect of hate speech. It's also unacceptable that when, when victims of online abuse post screenshots of the harassment they get, they are the ones who get locked out of their accounts while the harasser goes unpunished. Personally, I reported all the hateful comments that I showed you earlier, and none of the reports were successful, which may not be surprising, so, as such requests are increasingly being handled by bots and not people. However, one of these bots mistook my baby's chubby arm for a penis in one of my videos and threatened to suspend my account. So much for the use of artificial intelligence, at least for the time being. Now, we need to equip law enforcement with the funding, the technology, and the know-how to effectively handle online violence. In Iceland, where hundreds of cases of image-based sexual abuse are reported each year, the police has asked that the legislation on online abuse be made consistent with neighboring countries because these are cross-border crimes, and for international collaboration to be strengthened and expanded. The rapid changes in technology call for more intensive training of police officers, and according to the officers I've personally spoken to, they want to do so much more in this area, but they're simply met with a lack of political interest, funding, and will. But it shouldn't even be a question of will. It's an obligation. Multiple conventions, laws, and treaties that the EU member states are bound by require them to take action against all forms of violence against women, as illustrated on this slide. That includes collecting data on the prevalence of it so we can better understand the scope of the problem. I could go on and on, but I'm afraid that's all I have time for in this keynote. Bottom line is that making the internet a place where women and girls are safe to partake is a pressing task, not least now that humanity is facing some of its toughest challenges. Who knows? We might even end up saving the world. Thank you.